In Print Radio. In Print is a professional writer's organization located in Rockford, Illinois. We're dedicated to providing resources and education off the page and on the air. Hello, I'm Bob Francis. Today, In Print member Richard Pulver is talking with Paula Hendrickson. So, Paul, how did you end up in a career of freelance magazine writing full time? Because I can't do anything else, basically. <laughs> no, my, my dad was a freelance graphic artist. And when I graduated from college, he said, I'll give you two years to see if you can make it as a freelance writer. And that was because he'd had experiences of being let go or downsized. And he got to the point where he couldn't find a job as a graphic designer and had to go freelance. Mm -hmm. And he did better. He was happier, less stress, and earned more money freelance. Mm -hmm. So he encouraged me to at least try it for a couple of years. And I guess I had enough clients where he thought, okay, I guess, yeah, she can, she can do it. What was he going to do if, if you didn't meet the goals in, the, in two years? Would you just say, this isn't working? Or Yeah, then it would have had been a, like a real, like a corporate job or editing or something like that. I'd, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I would have gone to copywriting. Mm-hmm. That kind of interested me a little bit. But I think a lot of people just fall into your knack. I did. <laughs> and you often say like writing is like only... 10% is actually writing when you're freelancing. Mm-hmm. So where does the other 90% go? Marketing, networking, basic office administration. I mean, you need to make sure you've got your supplies and your bills are paid and you've got to keep your expenses for tax time. So there, there are all the little things that any business person is going to have to do because it is a freelance writing business. So it's almost like a small business. It is, yeah. You're self-employed, so you have to do all the nuts and bolts things that any business owner would do. And that includes promoting yourself and your services to your potential clients, whether they're magazines or corporations. And are you on Twitter and Facebook? Not Facebook. I'm avoiding Facebook like the plague. That that just seems more for personal stuff. I want to keep my social media to business things because it does take a lot of time. So I do Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and I'm kind of trying Google Plus, but it doesn't make that much sense to me yet. I have to actually try, put more effort into learning that one, but a bit better. It's not as easily helpful or accessible, I guess. Yeah, I I think Twitter appeals to me because of the immediacy of it, and it's short, short, short. You connect with people on the spot. They don't read your thing three days later or Mm. two days later. You either connect with them while they're there or not at all, basically. Or not at all. Yeah. How do you find enough steady work to eat and basically live off of? That goes back to marketing. When you're at your busiest is when you should still be marketing. A lot of people think, oh, I'm busy. I don't have time to send out query letters or letters of introduction or just even look for new markets to write for. But that's exactly the time you should be doing it to keep the workflow steady. But I think most writers probably have a week here and there where even the busiest ones have a little ebb and flow. I know one of my writer friends mentioned the other day that the past couple weeks had been slow for her, but she had intentionally slowed down Mm -hmm. a little bit. But you do have to make sure you try to maintain that pace. And it's tricky. I mean, I know people who have been freelancing for 15, 20 years who still are working on perfecting that. But I think as long as you make enough money to pay your bills, you're a success. Do you uh, extensively budget a lot to make sure you have enough at the end of each month? It's hard to budget when you don't know how much money is coming in. That's that's like the, the issue. And I'm I, like a lot of writers, I'm bad at math. But it's true. It's sad writers. but true. Yes, exactly. I try to keep my monthly expenses as low as possible. And you cut back where you can without sacrificing too much quality of life. And so I kind of know about how much I need to live on each month. And then my target goal is probably double that. And one of my writer friends, Lori Widmer, has a blog called uh, Words on the Page. Which is and, awesome, by the way. Oh, isn't it? She's, she's great. And she's all about marketing for writers. And any, any writer, beginning writer or someone who's been doing it for 50 years can learn something. Because every month she does a monthly assessment and encourages us to play along. 
And that really keeps you on your toes because you don't have to tell what your monthly goal is. But her last question is always is, bottom line, how did you do? And the first couple months this year, I, I did okay. This last month, I was 750 short of my goal. So that means I need to increase my market. My bottom line is I need to send out more ideas and stuff. So you're going to have months that are really great and some that are slower. So you can't spend the money right when you get it. You might want to, but you're like, oh, I have a big check. Let me go buy something. <laughs> no, you have to say, okay, I've got a big check. That'll tide me over a couple months just in case next month is low. And you just have to really be aware of what you expect to be coming in and what you expect to be going out. And don't rely on your clients to pay when they say you're going to because some won't. Most will, some won't. Along those lines, uh, what are some unexpected challenges from freelancing, such as delinquent clients? That's always one of the big surprises is that you do this great article. They love it. They publish it. It's in print. And they've contracted with you saying they're going to pay you so much money for the right to publish your article that they haven't paid you for yet and spend six, eight, I think 13 months was the longest I ever had to chase a payment. And I finally got it. Another problem is occasionally a publication will go under. They may have used your work, they may not have, but they go under before they can pay you. And that's happened to me twice in maybe like in the last 12 years. And the problem is, this is according to tax people I've talked to, not me. I'm not a tax expert. But if you figure your taxes by the cash method, which most freelance writers do, you can't declare that as lost income if somebody folds and doesn't pay you for work you did. It's just gone. Yeah. So you have to adapt and think, okay, chalk it up to a lesson learned. Other than that, there really aren't too many surprises for me other than sometimes how how many markets are out there that you might not suspect. Because every business, every company, there are written words everywhere. And it's your job to make sure they're written well. So sometimes they aren't. So you tell them, hey, that's a big surprise. You can find clients almost anywhere if you look. Yeah, like at a place like American Bungalow. Like there's just so many different niche markets out there. For American Bungalow, I live in a bungalow. I grew up in a bungalow. I love bungalows. And my sister has a classic Chicago bungalow, and it's gorgeous, original light fixtures and everything. And I decided, hey, American Bungalow is a cool magazine. Maybe they'll want it. And they did. And then I've written a few things for them since, but not very often. It's fun to mix it up and write about different things. And, of course, you haven't just written for American Bungalow. You've also written for Variety, Emmy. I mean, you've written all over the place. And it's probably interesting to chart your growth from one genre or, I guess, one niche market to the next. It's kind of weird because I started out writing mostly business articles for um, a publication that was in Rockford called Sales and Marketing Strategies and News. And they had different sections, a sales and a marketing and a strategy section. They had promotional and I don't even remember how many, but maybe like eight different sections of the magazine. So I got experience writing about different business aspects. And then I was able to take one of those ideas that touched on advertising and television and spin it into a query for Emmy Magazine, which is a television trade publication. And then from there, I was able to just slowly build a niche market of TV-centric articles. But I also, that, that article also was, that got me into Emmy was about this old house magazine, which also kind of segued to American Bungalow a little bit if you stretch it. So if you look at it all spread out, it kind of does connect in a semi-sensible yeah. way. It's all stuff that interests me, yeah. basically. So yeah, Which is the important thing, is that you're writing what interests you. Yeah. Um, have you always been doing that or was there ever a phase where you're just writing for uh, just to make ends meet even if it, the subject wasn't as interesting? I think there are always going to be some articles that are less interesting than others, but I think I've been pretty lucky for the most part. I, one of the things I love about freelance writing, especially magazine articles, is you get to learn something new with each one or you get to meet somebody new with each mm-hmm. one because I, I love writing personality profiles because you get to talk to a person and find out what makes them tick and 
you really connect with them on a new level, and then you get to convey that to the readers. It's a lot of fun. How do you approach an interview? What do you, you've interviewed Oprah in the car, you were talking to, um, is it Brandon Braga from Star Trek Mm -hmm. Next Generation, Ron Moore from Battlestar Galactica? Are you ever starstruck? Oprah did get me a little bit. There was no guarantee I was going to speak to her. I was interviewing her presidents, um, Sherry Salata and Eric Logan, and they're co-presidents of Harpo Studios and own the television network. And the publicist said, Oprah is in the building. She's taping shows. If she has time, she might stop in. So have a couple questions ready. And by the time she walked in, I had one question left. But I had (laughs) saved the Oprah question just in case. So, you know, I didn't have time to get nervous too much. I was just a little excited about being there anyway at Harpo. And when she came in after a momentary oh my gosh, this is Oprah. She's shaking my hand. She's looking me in the eye and she's so nice. (laughs) I just kind of said, oh, by the way, I was just to ask uh, Sherry and Eric this. And then Oprah answered, took off, and 12 minutes later, we had talked about several different things. I think one of the people that made me the most nervous was Joss Whedon. That's back when Buffy the Vampire Slayer was on. That was my favorite show. And Before he was as, as huge as he is now. He was still pretty darn huge. When I talked to him, he was actually working, I believe, on the pilot episode of Firefly. That was about out because we were doing an article for Emmy about creative risks in television that season. One was 24 Mm -hmm. with their real-time clock ticking thing. So talked to the producers of that. I wasn't nervous or anything, even though they're pretty big guys anyway. Another was Six Feet Under Mm -hmm. because it's a risque show about a funeral home. That's a little risky. And then the Buffy musical. Loved the uh, Buffy musical. More with feeling. Yes, yes. And one of the things that cracked Joss up the most was when I told him that my sister and I were actually singing through the entire thing while walking through the antique mall here in Rockford. <laughs> he was just quite pleased. But that, that one intimidated me a bit because he's so articulate and so smart and just such a creative genius. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to feel like such an idiot. But he was really, really friendly and got me in trouble with his publicist because the interview went too long, like half an hour too long. I actually had an interview with one of the Pete's from The Adventures of Pete and Pete on Nickelodeon that went yeah. on too long. I don't publicists know. don't like it. The no. people that are being interviewed don't care, but yeah, the, the yeah. publicists do not like it. I, I think that would have been the one that intimidated me the most would, would be Joss. We'll be back with more of Richard's interview with Paula right after this. Welcome back. Richard Palfer is talking with Paula Hendrickson. Were there any interviews that just went south? (laughs) Yeah. A long time ago when I was first starting out, I was doing an article for a publication, and in the topic they assigned me, I didn't choose it, was Chinese herbal medicines in the treatment of HIV and AIDS. I didn't know much about it. I researched it, talked to different people, and one of the sources they gave me just basically screamed at me on the phone because he thought I shouldn't be doing this topic because I don't even remember what it was. And I'm like trying to think, I I didn't pick out the topic. You know, please don't be mean to me. He was really mean. And I just kind of chalked it up to a person with like a borderline personality disorder having a bad day or something and told my editor and he's like, "Mm, okay, sorry about that. So we worked around it. Does that happen very often? That was the only time. That was the only time. I have had maybe two celebrities, in air quotes, celebrities. I don't think they were in, well, maybe they were intentionally rude, where they blew off the interview hour after hour after hour after hour. And that was first after postponing it several days. And I finally got to the point where I had to tell the publicists, if they're not on the phone, I'll do the article without them. And then they would call. And one guy put it off till 6.30 on Good Friday evening. And he was supposed to call me at 10 that morning, I think, and never said sorry. The interview went fine. He he was fairly pleasant for the interview. But I'm thinking, you know, if you inconvenience somebody that much, you should be able to say sorry for the inconvenience. 
I can't help but wonder who they are. Let's just say that the two people that this happened with were young actors, you know, in their first hit shows okay. who probably didn't have people saying no to them. And probably so. didn't have people telling them, you don't do that. Right. Yeah. The, the, you just have to, it's common courtesy. And that goes a long way, no matter who you're talking to. And speaking of common courtesy, when it comes to uh, getting paid, which is also <laughs> very, very polite to do to your employees, <laughs> what kind of things do you have at your disposal when it comes to chasing down late payments? I know you mentioned the contract. Is that really legally binding? Are you able to... Oh, contracts are always legally binding. And actually, assignment letters are most common with articles. And in the it usually email the editor or publisher will say, we're having you write this many words on this topic. It's due this date. This is the amount. They may list sources. They may suggest things they want covered. And that is, I think for all intents and purposes, is, is fairly binding. I don't know if it's technically legally binding, but it's enough that you can call them on it and force the issue. I've had one client a long time ago who they paid on publication because mm. you can pay, be paid on acceptance you can be paid on publication some places say they pay within 30 days of publication which is you know just that's a red flag but this place supposedly paid on publication and i wrote an article they postponed it an issue they were bi-monthly so you know that set it back a couple months understandable then they pushed it back yet another issue but they ran it mm -hmm. and then they still didn't pay me and I would call. They started calling maybe once a month. First, I, I sent them late notices in red type, past due, and they ignored it. And so then I, I started calling on a daily basis. And the editor, they couldn't help me because it's not their job to pay the bills. So I started asking for the, the accountant. And I would call, and they'd say, oh, sorry, he's at lunch. Okay, then I'd call later in the afternoon. Sorry, he's at lunch. I would call the next day. Oh, then it was, sorry, he's at lunch. We'll have him call you back. So after about a week, I said, that's the longest lunch in the history of lunches. I need to speak with him today. The guy called back, said, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have called back. I'm like, yeah, you should have. By the end of the day, the editor of that publication hand-delivered the check. That's the one that I think ended up being 13 months after I wrote the article, I finally got paid. But another one more recently, the guy, I, he was always slow at paying, but he was extra slow and then tried using the flu as an excuse for not having mailed the check. And I said, first of all, if you're running a business, you should have at least one other person who can sign checks. Or if you have the flu, you can still hold a pen. For him, I had to threaten legal action. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> In the past, to get him to pay, I would just say, I will have to seek alternate means of collection. And he could interpret that as a lawyer. He could interpret that as me sending, uh, you know, my crazy uncle with a vicious dog after him. I don't know. But that he would usually pay after a week or so after that. But this time he wasn't. So I did threaten legal action. And I think that they overnighted me a check pretty much the next day. And then I said, I'm done writing for you. You don't want to write for a place that doesn't respect you. And what are some things that maybe writers should be on the lookout for? What types of behavior do you think constitute bad treatment? It's better to just walk away. Well, first of all, there are some writer sites. Angela Hoy's Writers Weekly, I think is the name of her website. She has a whispers and warnings section, which is awesome because writers can share information they've had on bad experiences. So you can say, oh, I don't think I want to work for that place. I should have looked at that because the guy with the flu is the excuse not to sign the check. Ten years ago, somebody had complained about oh. the exact same thing, except he wasn't using the flu. So he had some other lame excuse. But, I mean, some red flags are places that pay after publication, only want to pay 5 or $20 an article, or want to, worse yet, want to pay per click-through because you have no way of calculating yeah. that. And anyone, if an ad says that they're going to give you exposure or that you can work in your pajamas, those mean they don't respect you and you're not going to get paid well. So you can just avoid them. As, as I think I saw in one web short, are, are we going to be exposed to any money? Is, <laughs> yes, is, exactly. Is the, uh, Another is one the, is exposure kills. So. Yeah. <laughs> Exposure kills. You just like you would normally run from exposure from a disease of exactly. some sort. Exactly. Yeah. 
one thing I've struggled with as a part-time freelancer is not overburdening myself and just getting burnt out. So do you have a way of setting boundaries of maybe making sure you only work like nine to five, but a way that you have a set schedule that's not going to keep you uh, going till long hours into the night? Yeah, I think after you've done it a while, most writers do kind of come up with whatever schedule works for them. I know some writers who spend their mornings just relaxing, doing their thing, and then write in the evenings. For me, um, most of the clients I work with are on the West Coast, so I'm, I'm usually in my office like 9 to 6, 9 to 7. Not necessarily every minute. I can run off to the store, whatever, go walk my dog. But I try to keep the regular hours because that, it is a business, and you should be available as much of a business day as you can. I mean, if you're doing a part-time, maybe you're available just evenings or whatever it is. Like, I'm going to have to work this weekend because I had a very crazy week with interruptions this week. So I know tomorrow I have to start writing an article that is way past due. Thankfully, I have a very understanding editor, and it's for a website, not a print magazine, which you have to get in on time. With the schedule, I'm working to try to keep my weekends free. And definitely, I turn the computer off in the evening, and that's it. My work day is done. Every once in a while, you have publicists or editors who expect you to work around the clock or be at their disposal. And if they want that, they should really be paying a premium because you're a freelancer. You're not a full-time employee. You're not salaried. You don't have to be there. You need your own time. So I, I'm working. I'm trying to get better about not working on weekends, but sometimes we have to do it. Now, how do you go about tracking down sources? Like you mentioned this article you're going to start tomorrow. What's the process of finding sources that are reputable? That one was really hard. You wouldn't think it is. It's a, a career career planning article about realtors, actually, because I I write for a a website called Bridges.com, which is a college and career planning site for teenagers. And you would think it would be easy to find realtors. Well, I found a local guy that was really great and willing to talk. This website is for the U.S. and Canada, so I always have to have at least one Canadian source. Found her, and I was struggling. I wanted a realtor in a warm climate to compare Canada, Illinois, and how a realtor's job may differ in the South. And I just couldn't find anyone. I was going through referrals. I know people in Texas and uh, California. And I was saying, okay, do you know any realtors? But everyone they sent me, they're great, they're great. They never got back to me. And I don't know if I went to PR Newswire, their ProfNet, for that article or not. But that's a great source for finding articles, as is Harrow, help a reporter out. But with this realty one, I finally yesterday got a realtor in Louisiana. But I have got him through a national association. And that's always a great, if you're looking for experts, find an association of that industry and their their media contact can usually help you out as she did like, yesterday oh my gosh it was like wonderful maybe like uh, like guilds and trade publications and yeah well not even their publications just like say you're writing about plumbers and maybe there's the I'm I'm making it up maybe there is one National Plumbers Association you can find somebody there if, if you're not looking for a local one you need somebody in an area you, of the country you don't know anyone at yeah they they can help you connect with people outside your area We'll be back with more of Richard's interview with Paula right after this Welcome back to Imprint Radio. I'm Bob Francis. Imprint member Richard Pulfer is talking with Paula Hendrickson. So in addition to finding real estate agents in the South and dealing with clients who have a debilitating flu that prevents them from reaching into their bank account, what are some other like horror stories you faced on the job and how have you dealt with them? How have you, you know, learned from them? Well, I don't know if it's a horror story, but one time an editor called or emailed and said he had just had a writer flake on him. This guy was supposed to deliver an article. This was about the TV show Medium back when that was on. And Glenn Gordon Karen was the creator, executive producer, and they needed a profile of him. The writer who was supposed to do it didn't do it, and they needed it within 24 hours. 
okay, I can do that. (laughs) The problem was Glenn's schedule wasn't free until 5 o'clock his time, which was 7 o'clock my time. So in a case like that, if it's for a great client, I will work evenings. So I did the interview that night, transcribed it that night, wrote the article in the morning and got it in by my noon deadline. And sometimes it's really nice to have a challenge like that just to prove you can do it. But, oh, my gosh, that was hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the frustrating part was the, all that time leading up to the interview where I could be doing something, but I couldn't because I hadn't done the interview. So but, it sounds like you just have to keep yourself flexible and just keep moving with the punches. Yeah. I, otherwise, I haven't really – I can't think of anything that would really be a horror story. Which is good. Yeah. Which is, which is good. Most people in full-time careers can't can't say that. I mean, the, the thing is always, you know, you worry that there's a client that's not going to pay. I mean, I've, I think I mentioned earlier, I've had a couple cases where the publication folded mm. and I didn't get paid. And that's more like heartbreaking because one of them was an article I really, really loved that never ran. Can you uh, reprint it or You know, I, I, I got close on that. And actually, it's, when I just said that, I thought... Huh, that's an old chestnut I might be able to talk to one of my editors about because the topic's becoming more prevalent again. So They would have still have the rights to it even after it folded, would they? They didn't buy all rights to okay. begin with. That's the thing you have to watch out for, too, is which rights you're assigning. And from everything I've gathered, unless they specifically say they're buying all rights— they're just buying the first rights. But maybe like the online to print it online because in fact I like it when they want to post my article online because it's easier to share share it with other people because not all magazines do that. And then I'm just like, oh, how am I going to share my clip the old-fashioned way? You have to mail it or uh-huh. something. Well, also along the same lines, how do you market yourself as a freelance writer? And does it involve social media? Uh, more and more, it does. My favorite tool is a letter of introduction, which I built up to doing that. Until then, it was just all query letters, which it's similar. I think a letter of introduction is a query letter, but you don't have to send an idea. So it's like a late easy query letter to me (laughs) because sometimes there's a great publication and you know you could be a good fit but you might not have an idea that suits them or some publications they use freelancers but they come up with their own ideas Mm. so it's perfect for something like that a lot of trade publications are like that because they know the industry inside and out and trade publications are a really great place to write for or great places to write for. One of the things I've always had trouble with is like putting a price on your skills because it's easy to do that when you know someone says, I'm going to pay you minimum wage or I'm going to pay you $15 an hour or $20 an hour. That's their business. But when you have to say, okay, what is my time worth? How do you go about that? Well, a lot of writers undervalue themselves and I'm include myself in that group. It's hard. Most of my my assignments tend to be articles where the magazine determines the price. But when I have a client where they want me to quote a price, I am discombobulated again. <laughs> I like that word today. And okay. yes, for me it is. <laughs> for me, it's usually my usual day. <laughs> but I have trouble because I am not good at estimating how much time something's going to take, unless it's something I've done a million times before. If I'm writing a profile, like the, I knew that one I could turn around in one day because I had done it. I knew I'd be spend this much time on the interview, this much time transcribing, this much time writing. So you get a feel for that. But if it's copywriting, I don't know how long it's going to take, and I don't know how many revisions they're going to want. So you just have to do your best guessing. And then I know most writers that do this regularly will then give a quote that's a little bit more than they really expect. And then if it's not that much, then they can be really generous because they didn't use the entire budget. But there are a lot of writers' websites out there that have worksheets and stuff to help calculate how much you need to earn per hour to meet your monthly expenses. And it's mind-boggling to me, but you can break it down and the thing is, most writers to meet their expenses because we have to pay our own insurance, our own withholding, our own retirement, all of that. You have to really charge a lot. I mean, there's a lot of writers I know are charging well over $100 an hour for copywriting type services. And it's hard to get used to saying that, oh, I'm worth that. But when you think about it, You have a plumber come in, and they're charging probably $70 an hour if you're lucky. 
and you don't even quibble because they're the experts. They know what they're doing. Well, you as a writer are the expert as well, and you have to kind of get used to that. And it's, it's a work in progress for me yeah. anyway. And speaking of writers in general, what do you think they can learn from freelance writing? Do you think any writer, like even a fiction writer, a nonfiction writer, a poet, should maybe try their hand at freelance writing? I don't know if, if they're comfortable with it. I can see a fiction writer doing it, a poet. I don't know. Sometimes some poets don't like punctuation too uh-huh. much. I do, though, know a couple poets who are very good freelance writers as well. It's definitely, if you want to try it, try it. You send a, a query out, and if they want it, they'll ask you to write it. It can be risky on the ego because you get more rejections than acceptances, but that's part of the game. That's like part of the game for any writer. Do you think it takes a certain personality, though, or a certain type of lifestyle to really work as a freelance writer? You have to be extremely disciplined because there's so many temptations when you work from home. You're going to watch daytime TV or you're going to just, oh, it's a nice day, I'm going to go to the park. Well, you're working, your you're work hours. It's It should be very very precious to you. The the biggest hurdle I've heard from a lot of writers, and I'm included in this, is that friends, relatives, neighbors don't always respect that. They Mm -hmm. think you're at home. I once had a friend who called to ask if I could babysit her sister's kids because she had to work. I said, what do you think I'm doing? I can't watch her kids. I'm working. They're her kids. Her problem. And think because you're at home, you have nothing better to do. Yeah, but they probably also don't know the work that goes into writing. Like they, yeah. they think like, okay, it's like you're writing. Okay, is that that's gonna take you what, like a half hour? <laughs> that is kind of the thing too, because I do know people who think that if I'm not actively writing something. I have free time. So I try to explain it as a light writing day versus a heavy writing day. Or if it's an interview day. Because when it's an interview day, I don't want anybody calling me because that phone needs to be free. Especially if the interviewee is the one calling me. And you just kind of have to set your boundaries and go from there. And keep reminding people, I'm working. To to close, uh, you do write most about TV shows, so... What are some of your favorite TV shows on right now, assuming you have time to watch them? <laughs> there, there are a lot. The Americans, Walking Dead. Oh, gosh, I was just addicted to Scandal the other night. But there's sometimes I love shows and hate them at the same time. <laughs> um, and that's kind of one of them because it really sucks you in, and then you're like, oh. I fell for it. Um, but it's, it's, it's good, though. I can't even write right now. My mind's going blank because my DVR is so full. I haven't yeah. watched all of them no. yet. But yeah, the, right now, like, get excited knowing that The Americans is going to be on. Or Sleepy Hollow. It's not on right now, but yeah. I really love that. Really it's like it's it. a bizarre little show that I just love. So, And I, I, I do like some comedies as well, but I, I tend to go more for the odd dramas. Well, thank you, Paula. Well, thanks for having me. This has been fun.